This is Friday, June 7th, 2019. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Jim Martin. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> May I ask when you were born? October 14th, 1944. And where were you born? I was born at Boston Lion Inn Hospital. And what community do you currently live in? I live in the community of Westwood, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I am married for 46 years. Do you have children? I have two daughters, and two, two grandchildren. Okay. So Jim, uh, tell us a bit about life in Boston. Life in Boston, what time, when I was growing up, mm -hmm. I was, I was, I, I had an older brother, so when he, he when, when the, my twin and I came home, suddenly he was sort of, what's going on, okay? He was overwhelmed, and he still is to this day, because he had his twin brothers, and they came about a little over a year after he was born, uh, and then he, myself and my twin brother, had a sister who, who came two years behind, on it, right after that. So within a five-year period or a four-year period, my mother had four kids. Okay, let's call it as it is. Uh, and three other boys followed after that over a number of years. Some were not expected, okay? They were uh, not planned, however you define it, okay? But that's the way life runs today. Or it always runs. Uh, the, uh, we grew up in a, originally was at the Orchard Park housing project during World War II, and it was located in Rock Spring, near Dudley Square. My father worked nights, days, whatever, at the Boston Navy Yard in Charlestown, so he rode the L from Dudley over to uh, City Square in Charlestown, working six, seven days a week sometimes during the war. He was a, he was a sheet metal man, welder, uh, that type of work. Uh, so he was working a lot. So my mother was fortunate in the sense that she had some people who helped her out, family members and the like. One of whom was a gentleman named Timmy. Timmy was a janitor in the housing project where we lived for until we were about a year and a half old. Uh, Timmy's job was a janitor. However, his, his wife was my mother's cousin. So Timmy uh, was a janitor there. Every day, about two, two or three times a day, because of the number of kids in there, he would poke his head in the door after knocking on the door and said, Ann, anything I could do to help you? So if she needed a quart of milk or a loaf of bread or something of this nature, Timmy was around. If there were other situations, he was around to do something for her. Uh, tell, she had a mother had a telephone, but that, that was all she had to talk to the world. Those TVs and radios, radios were there, but TVs were non-existent at the time. But she was busy anyway. We also had some family members who lived not too far away in Jamaica Plain. Okay, these happened to be fortunately ladies, and these ladies were my cousins, and they were quite a bit older than me, uh, and they would spend a lot of time uh, helping their uncle's kids. Okay taking care of these things. So it wasn't as if my mother was high and dry with a bunch of kids. People were out to help her out. She had some aunts in Rosendale, not too far down the road, who took care of things as well. So the family was extended to a large degree here, however you wanted to find that term. Uh, with the coming of, of uh, the, the twins home, uh, the, the way, I think there was only one or two bedrooms. The, 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 the saying was that we had to, my, particularly when my mother found it, probably that, that another one was coming along who happened to be my sister, uh, we, we had to move to South Boston to another project on Carson Beach. It was the Colony Housing Project. Uh, my father had, took a little longer for him on the, on the tee to get to work. The cars were rationed during World War II, so he, he had to take the MBTA. There were no, very few people had cars. Gasoline, it was ration card and the like. So it took him a little bit longer, so he wasn't home as often or as long, however you define it. Uh, the other one was a straight train line in from Dudley, two minutes away from the house, all the way to Charlestown. This way, she, he had to make a couple of changes in the tea. So uh, th th that went on. on. We, we, we stayed in this project until child number seven came along, okay? 
and at channel number seven, uh, the money was, 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 was available somehow, or whatever, to move on to a house uh, uh, just over the line in, in Dorchester, uh, in St. Margaret's Parish uh, on Buttonwood Street. Uh, the family resided there for many years thereafter, but by the time we got there, the older members of the family, uh, the three older boys, uh, uh, weren't in residence in Dorchester for more than four years before they did Uncle Sam duty or they moved on to other places, so I got married. So th the family moved late from the projects into the other facility, the, 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 mm -hmm. the house. Now, Jim, where did you go to school? Uh, I started off just like she had mentioned. I, I was in kindergarten. I was a kindergarten student at the Michael J. Perkins School. However, I developed a problem with a right hip uh, uh, situation where the, the, the joint was wearing away. Okay, It is a term called leg, L-E-G-G, -G, after a doctor. It is not one G, it's two Gs after the doctor. Uh, I get nailed for using uh, two G's in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a composition I had to write in school. And I get my wrist slapped for doing it as such, but I had to explain the situation to the teacher. Uh, but it was two G's. Uh, and th this was a situation which was somewhat of an epidemic because around me at Mass Hospital School, where they sent me for the next three and a half years, there were people from South Boston, people from Charlestown, people from from Brookline, so some of the situations, child in East Boston and like. Every section of the city of Greater Boston seemed to have one or two of us. It's, I don't know how it was developed, but it was a degeneration of the hip, at which time they put a brace on us where our right, our left, whatever it would be where the hip was, uh, would be in a brace where you couldn't put the, 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 the shoe on the ground per se, and you had a big block on the other shoe. Uh, we went to school. Classes were only about 10 or 12 students. The whole K to 12 situation, and there were people at all grade levels there, uh, were, were probably about 12 kids per, per, per grade, that was it. So there was a, it was a, like the old one room schoolhouse expanded a bit, okay? Because we all had our, that one teacher and 12 students, rough, rough figures per grade. Uh, I was there for three and a half years. The, the, we had physical therapy and other things there, and, uh, things got better after a while. I mean, they, they, they knew it would run its course. Today they operate. Uh, they're more aggressive with the thing, and, and they take care of that, so you're not laid up as long, okay? We were, we were not lacking for too many things out there. The, the, the doctor who handled this thing across the eastern part of Massachusetts, in fact, for the, for the state, his, his last name was Bradford. He was a specialist at Lake Prentice, and that's and specialist, and his, his brother just at that point in time <coughs> happened to be the governor of Massachusetts. And this was a state-funded institution. So we, we didn't lack for too many things like that there. I mean, we had no problem with snow removal. We had, it was on a farm, and it was like most state hospitals at that time, these farms had to be self-sufficient for food and other things of this nature. So we had pigs, cows, chickens, uh, we had horses, uh, you name it, they were there. And you'd go around the, the farm there and, and see all the animals and, and the like, okay? Uh, they had fields where they had corn growing, asparagus, and uh, you, had, uh, you had rhubarb, and we would sneak over the fields and cut the rhubarb and take some of that. Uh, we weren't supposed to. It was not to be done, but was, we did it anyway. But it was a, an interesting experience. And one of the gauges, which you knew how long you'd been there, because you could see new cars every year that ro rotate the fleet, not necessarily brand new ones, but rotating the fleet. You could look at the latest car that came in, it was the latest Chevy. They didn't have a lot of them, but you knew where it was, so you knew how long after a while you were there, okay? Because you had seen so many cars, brand new cars from, let's say, in, in, in my case, let's say it was, it was say, 48, 49, 50, mm -hmm. 51. So you could see the new Chevrolets that were coming in. Teenagers at that time, there were only so many cars. We don't have what we have today. Uh, but, but you could gauge how long you were there uh, at the facility without looking at a walk calendar. Uh, the, they had religious uh, services there were provided. And that's a story to itself because we're affiliated that the, the Catholic Church from which is my religion uh, was handled by St. John's Church in Canton. 
and the nuns would come out and give us uh, uh, religious instruction there, First Communion, etc., etc. And it, the world can be very small because uh, my only sister, my favorite sister, she was residing in New Hampshire, and she was ch having a chit chat with one of the nuns up there at this time. This is years and years later, okay? Uh, my sister at that time, when I was there, she would have been uh, two years younger than me. So, but the, the nun there remembered being my CCD teacher at that time at Mass Hospital School in Kent. That shows you how small the world is. This is up in uh, Kingston, New Hampshire, where she met this, the, 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 this nun. So, it, well, you never know what, what, what can go on. Uh, at a certain point, I was phased back, once my leg was taken care of, uh, phased back into the, the city of Boston. I went back to the, the project with, the, with my brothers and sister, went on to, to school with my brothers and sisters. I checked in at the fourth grade. I had left school in Boston uh, at the start of the kindergarten, so I was out for a couple of years, obviously. Uh, and somebody said, uh, what did you, how, what kind of transcript you have? I says, well, at the very top of it, it read Commonwealth of Massachusetts Bureau of Institutional Schools. And it started with that. And, and, I, and somebody made the comment to me once when I said that situation, you know, you would never be accepted into a charter school today, okay, with that Bureau of Institutional Schools because they didn't really know anything about where you had been. That they, they, they would fare for the worst, okay? That, that you were somebody uh, that could have a, a lot of mental health issues, put it that way. Mm -hmm. So it, it was, it's an interesting take, and it didn't originate with me, as, as several people have commented on that. You know, you would never get into a charter school today. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not talking private schools, we're just talking charter schools. Mm -hmm. uh, private schools, if you had the money, you'd get there anyway, okay? So mm -hmm. you, you get the cash. Okay, so Jim, you're back in Boston Public Schools. Um, uh, no, parochial schools. Parochial schools, pardon me. So during this period, which is now the 1950s, uh, were you made aware of events happening overseas, Korea, Vietnam? We were, we, I, I Vietnam would be me, but right. mm -hmm. going back to Korea, the lady who was the house mistress in her, her, uh, at social worker type, at Mass Hospital School on the level I was at for say first, second, third, fourth grade, her son was in Korea. Okay, her name was Mrs. Leno. Her husband's name was Sal. Their child was 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 in fighting somewhere during the Korean War. Uh, their only child, I believe. Okay, so Mrs. Leno and and her husband. Both were, were, were handicapped in the sense that they had crutches on to go around and like, but their son, obviously, the offspring was good. He was, he was draftable, however you look at it, for Korea, okay? And he was in the Korean War. So we would hear it periodically. Uh, now, I'm coming out of this facility, and, and as I said, uh, the beginning of the fourth grade. So everything is up to speed from that point on. Uh, I'm back in the real world out there, however you want to define it. I'm back with my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Now, I wasn't there all the I was there, but they would come down every week and visit. Father would take us out to get ice cream or something of this nature. The kids would run around the farm, okay? Mm -hmm. So it was there. I mean, as the ladies would say, the door would open out of a Model A Ford, Model A Ford, uh, uh, maroon color, and out just the two doors out would, would come about five kids, okay? And every so often, there'd be one more kid added to the list, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is how, how the people knew who, who we were, okay? Mm -hmm. So it, and if my mother or father couldn't make it on a weekend up to take me out for an hour or two, go somewhere in the area of Blue Hills or somewhere, uh, if they didn't make it, my aunt uh, over in De Dedham would be over to see me, and she would do the same, and I had an aunt and, and, and Rosendale, who would do the same if she wasn't available either. So the, the extended family clearly was available in that situation. Mm -hmm. So I was not alone. It was important because the, the vast majority of these kids there didn't see their family more than two or three times a year, if that. So it was, it was a, a, a difficult situation for many of them. My mother was there every week. So Jim, uh, let's get you back into uh, Boston Parochial Schools. It's the 1950s, and I'm just kind of curious, uh, when did you see a television for the first time? 
uh, I, I saw a television for the, I saw a television, I probably, they, they may have had them at Mass Hospital School, okay? They may have been one or two around. I think there were a couple. But they, they were in the group room, rec room there. Uh, but when the, the TV was, was there in, in, in school at it, St. Augustine's, okay, uh, we would be watching uh, Howdy Doody Say. We, we would be watching uh, a Dick Clark type of program on music, okay, a variety of things. Uh, and it, it, was, it, was, it was a big box, and this is where they, we gathered at, after school, if, as long as we had done our homework, okay. Homework had to, had it be done before that mm -hmm. time. Do you remember watching anything with uh, John F. Kennedy, like the inauguration? Uh, I, I, I watched the JFK inauguration. Uh, JFK comes in as an important point down the road that probably isn't listed too many places. Uh, I was a student at Boston State College freshman year when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Now, when I talked, and I later on be became a was a history major at the time, but uh, it was it hit us hard, okay, very hard, of course, because he was a Bostonian and well liked Bostonian. Uh, and the scene here, w w w which hit us hard, was that later on, uh, when the draft came into play, uh, my draft notice was in my hand, Mass Hospital School or otherwise, uh, and my twin brother, he and I were both had draft notices to report to duty. Now, we spent some time looking to get into the schools of Boston as tenured teachers before, our appointed teachers before we went on active duty, he with the Navy, we with the Marine, me with the Marine Corps. Now, uh, and we managed to get under the wire there. We were uh, appointed prior to that. But it's, it's strange because years later, you would talk to these teachers, males, of course, because of the draft factor, you'd find that these guys came to the same draft board in Dorchester, South Boston that you had, but under Kennedy, they were not drafted from the schools of Boston as teachers. Kennedy did not have a draft. When LBJ got into the White House, is these guys who were older than me, who would be probably four or five years old, they would tell you, no, draft didn't chase teachers. As long as we were in the schools teaching, these are phys ed teachers, variety of history teachers. In other words, the, the, the draft didn't hit the Boston school system, per se, uh, until Kennedy was gone. It's, uh, cause he, and this is, I'm told by people, this was a national situation. LBJ got rid of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so teachers were uh, open to the draft. So Jim, uh, you being a history major, what do you remember being told about the Russians, the Cold War, uh, right, uh, right before you were drafted? Uh, we were going back a bit. We, 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 had our, we had our drills in case there was a, 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 there was a nuclear attack. That This went back to elementary school. So all along you would have these drills in elementary. They, would, they, they primarily came to a halt however, when we hit the college, maybe we hit the high school situation. So after I switched over to the public schools in, in the ninth grade, uh, we no longer had that factor. It wasn't there. But before, you had to have your drills, and, and that's the way it went, okay? I uh, remember the signs up there. The signs up there were colored yeah, like a, like a, an, a pie, pie-shaped sign with yellow and, and black, okay? And the, the text would be yellow, and the background would be black. Okay, remember these signs are all over the place. The fallout shelters. The fallout shelters and things of this nature. It, it, by the time I was in high school, they seemed to have faded out or were fading out fast. So uh, it, it didn't affect us in college per se. Okay. So just to kind of get our bearings here, when did you graduate from high school? I graduated from high school in 1962. And you went to Boston State. Right. And you graduated in 1966? I graduated in 1966. All right, so, and you were appointed a teacher. I was appointed a teacher, correct. And when was that? I, I was appointed a teacher 
I was class of 66. I was appointed a teacher in De on December 1st of 1966. I haven't been a, a provisional teacher in the Boston schools since September of 66. And when were you drafted? I, I was drafted, I, I had a draft notice like my twin. I had a draft notice probably around March or April of 66, well before graduation. The point of graduation, I, I was gonna have a new post office box. All right, Jim. Uh, when did you start your career in the military, namely the Marine Corps? Okay, I, I started my career in the Marine Corps, and it's, and it's interesting because when I open my mouth out there, they know where I'm from, okay? I'm from Boston. I parked my car in Harvard Yard. Now, I, I, I checked into duty, leaving the Grover Cleveland School as a, as a teacher at the time. Grover Cleveland was at Fields Corner. I was, as I was filling in, a, I was supposed to be a, a, a history teacher, but I was filling in be, because the guy hadn't left yet, but they had an English opening, so I filled in as an English teacher for six, six weeks. However, by the middle of January of 67, I'm down in Quantico, Virginia, along the Potomac River. The temperature is as cold as it is in Boston down there. It's wet, it's snow, icy, and all that. And I'm out at front with uh, 200 other in, uh, young guys uh, in uniform at five in the morning. The sun was starting to come up a bit. And the drill instructor of these 200 guys, the head drill instructor says, I'm looking for this guy from Boston. I want to hear him talk. I want to hear him talk about parking his car and have it yet. So of the 200 people, I drew the lottery number that brought me out front for whatever reason. And I had to explain my park in my car in Harvard Yard. Now, the company, the, the officer was a guy who was a former running back from, from Auburn University, okay? He lost an eye in Vietnam as a lieutenant, okay? And they were ready to move him out for medical reasons. However, uh, he managed to work us, uh, and he lost a lot of his people physically, me included. Uh, because he would have us run up the logs or go down the logs on ice and everything else, and a lot of broken arms, legs here and there, etc. I banged up a knee, okay? I was pulled out of the organization at the time, put into a casualty platoon until this knee handled itself, left knee, uh, with physical therapy and other things. I could get down to the, to the, to the stables at Quantico and I could shovel the, the, the stuff with the horses. However, the typical PFC on base was not that was cruel and unusual punishment for him. He, he, he was not allowed to do that type of work, okay? The, the guy in the brig was not allowed to come out of the brig and work the stables. However, people like me were assigned to that type of duty, okay? We didn't have the so-called rights that everybody else had, okay? So we were there, and, and that weather was getting cold, and I, was, I found it was a job as a chaplain's assistant. My cousin had done this to me in the cold weather. But I, I didn't last too long because I couldn't type. So I, I was shuffled out of there very quickly, heading back to the stables in a sense. So we, we worked from there. But at the later on, I, 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 I met the guy who was the lieutenant with the bad eye running back from Auburn University. Later on, I met him at 29 Palms, California. At this time, he had two stars, okay? So he, he did okay. He had. He had a godfather or two looking after him, making sure things went well. Not because with his eye, a long one eye, usually as an officer, one eye or a staff and CO, you go, you're out, basically. But he had some godfathers or fathers somewhere because he just didn't finish his three-year tour. He went on to 20-something years, 30, whatever. So some, some people know a higher god than others, who knows? Mm -hmm. So Jim, I just wanted to step back a little bit. Um, did you choose the Marines or did the Marines choose you? That's a very good question. I, I, I chose the Marine Corps. I, 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 had, I had the draft. The draft had me, there was no question. Uh, I was told by my, 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 my sister that my mother wasn't too happy, that she had paperwork that was showed that my knee was gonna get, my, my leg parentheses could get me out of the situation. But 
But my sister told her, no, 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 no. He's not going to like that if he hears that because he's, 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 it's going to hang as, as forever. In other words, I'd be like George Bush there with my, with my physical from the, the, the society doctor who worked in an office owned by George's father, George Bush's father. I mean, we're talking today's news here is where we're coming from here. So I, I wasn't going to take that way out. Okay, so now you're in the Marine Corps, you're down in Virginia, you're right. shoveling what comes out of the horses. Right, and, and as my, my knee got better, and they put me into the program again, the OCS program. I, I passed the OCS program. I was in pretty good shape because during the days, <coughs> I had a friend who had an old VW a Beetle. He was a, a life insurance guy out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, and, and he and I would go to the pool every day up in, uh, about 10, 15 miles away. And we stayed in shape by doing exercises, swimming laps in the pool and the like. So that when the time came that summer for me to go running up and down logs and climbing things, I was in pretty good condition. I had that. But it's a question of being at the right place at the right time. Because it, as I said, he needed somebody to talk to and he, and he and, and I needed somebody to give you a lift, and he we both went up there every three, five or six days a week. Very so good for you. So when did you get out of the OCS program? I got out of the at the OCS program. I got out in in in, 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 in August of of sixty seven. And you received a commission. I received a commission. Second lieutenant. A second lieutenant as a brown bar. Okay, Jim, tell us what happened next. Okay, the next evolution is that the, I went there and I, I received my commission in the summer and I was just at basic infantry school as a second lieutenant in, in September. So I was, had another, I had a week or two off to go up to Boston and visit wife, maybe not my wife, my, uh, my, my family and, and the whole thing. Uh, then I came back and I was, at 20, for six, 26 weeks, I was down in Quantico, Virginia, second, as a second lieutenant in infantry school. And I, I, I graduated, and they sent me from there. They were going to send me to communication school. And somebody said, why? I said, I didn't know at the time, but my GCT was very high up there, very, very high. Marine Corps is not known for high GCTs, okay? This is uh, not what people necessarily in Marine Corps want to hear, but it's... it's the, 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 we, we get in there, okay? Uh, but and they're known for physical fitness factors, okay, supposedly. But there are a lot, on the other hand, too. Uh, there's a Brigadier General, or a three-star general who I know today, or I was in school with him all those years. Uh, he, he's a lawyer today. He also had a high GCT. He was a comm officer, too. So, I mean, this is the way it is. But the, the attrition rate for communication officers in the Marine Corps is the highest of all of, all of them after three years. They don't stay around. They find other activities outside that. Uh, before we uh, continue on with that, I couldn't help but notice that you were in Boston the summer of 67, the, the impossible dream year. Uh, where, did your family follow the Red Sox? Uh, 67, mm -hmm. 66, 67, yeah. 67 would have been Early on in June, my twin brother get married in 67. Uh -huh. I was in Boston for that. Okay. Okay. And I was to start the 10-week OCS program at that point. Mm -hmm. Now, her father was getting married in August, way back at the end of the summer. I was nowhere to be seen. I was on duty at Quantico, Virginia. Okay. But however, you're bringing out a very good point. Uh, I have a younger brother uh, who Name is, name, Joe is his name for the record. Mm -hmm. Joe had some money in his hand. Jo I had some money in my hand. I had a little break time between starting after being commissioned as a second lieutenant, okay, an OCS, and going to infantry school. And I took off at a place called Montreal. So I, I was not, this is the summer that you're referring to, 67. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, I'm Joe and I are Expo 67 in Montreal. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, however, it was not a happy occasion for certain people because 
my, my, my future sister-in-law was, was ticked because I didn't make the wedding rehearsal for my brother, okay, who you met before here, mm -hmm. okay? So he, she wasn't too happy because Joe and I were in Montreal at the same time as the wedding rehearsal was going on. <laughs> but we, Joe and I showed up and did what we had to do for the wedding, and that was okay. <laughs> now, as I said, then at that point, I'm, being, I'm headed for other schools. But so. Uh, w w we move on with, with, with that. So the older brother, I was not around. I was in, in the program for that. His, he got married in August. I was back into OCS for, this, for, for, for right. this, finishing up the summer. Okay, so um, when did you get out of infantry school in Quantico? I got out of infantry school in, in Quantico. Uh, that would have been infantry school in Quantico. I would have gotten out probably around April. April of 68? 68. And what happened next? What happened then, it, 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 at that point, I, I could be off a month or two, but it, at that point, I, the, the, they only had, the, the line was cut at, the, at, at M for comm school, which was on post, on base at Quantico. So uh, seven, seven of us had to wait for the next class to convene. And in my case, I was the only bachelor of the seven. Okay, of, of the seven, and they sent me down to be the training officer for the for the for Marines who were guards at the brig, who were MPs, and who worked the ranges, rifle range, pistol range, range control people like that. I was the training officer, and it was an interesting experience because I worked for a Mustang captain, a Mustang is farmer enlisted captain, I, and he says. He says, Lieutenant, I, you're here for the duration, okay? However, you, you're, you're fortunate because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be following First Sergeant Joe Black. Joe Black is the First Sergeant here, and you're going to follow him until we assign you somewhere else, okay? Well, First Sergeant Joe Black was a great guy. Joe Black later on became the number one Sergeant Major in the Marine Corps. So this Mustang clearly knew his... His, the guy who was his first sergeant was going up, up the pole, okay, and he did. So Joe Black taught me a lot, okay. Now, what was happening then, and then they, later on they sent me over to comms com company when they realized that I should be over there too, getting ready to do what the Marine Corps was, 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 was going to pay me to do. So while at comm company, I had, there was an interest in American history that happened in Washington, not in Washington, D.C. It happened outside of long way from Washington, where a preacher from, uh, from the Salt came, Martin Luther King, gets assassinated. Mm -hmm. Now, I was, at the time, where I was a young second lieutenant. I was waiting to go to comm school. I worked for a captain by the name of Howo, H-O-W-O. -O. He was a, a Chinese-American, okay, who grew up and what was, when he grew up, was, was Chinatown of Washington, D.C. Surprisingly, yes, there was a Chinatown in Washington, D.C. Way, way back, okay? Uh, every place has its Chinatown, as you look at it. Well, John Howe, and I learned a lot from John Howe over the, him, I met him later on quite a few times. But in, in his case, he said, he said, we're gonna cut this thing small. We were stationed in Anacostia, which is the old Air Force station across the river. We were ready for riot control duty. We had a sharp guy who's a Mustang lieutenant colonel named Mooney. He was a good friend of a, a, the commandant of the Marine Corps, it's the way things go. It was a guy named uh, Green was the commandant of the Marine Corps. And this guy here said, you know, looked at us, looked, we, he had a conference, I was not at the conference. He says, we're not going to come in with the AR-15s. We're going to use the old M14, the, the, the rifle, and somebody says, why? I says, the other is confrontational, okay? It's shot, a little bayonet at the end of it. That's not good for riot control. But this is a hill boy out of Vermont, for the record. I didn't say West Virginia, Vermont. But he was down to earth, and he said, we're gonna use that, and that way the local people, if there's a problem, I said, if there's a problem, we're gonna use the butt, the wooden stock. So they gotta see the wooden stock, butt at the end, they're not gonna see the muzzle. So we're not looking to have a blowout here. We're looking for just keeping people in line if they step out. We're not looking for a conflagration here. 
And he was absolutely right because once we hit the streets, and there were a couple of hundred of us, okay, once we hit the streets doing a variety of things, uh, the, the, you could see the people settle down. But it wasn't the only reason that the people settled down. Because in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, all the big newspapers had all of the pictures, the pictures of all of the rifles that this guy James Earl Ray had that they took out of his, his room, his hotel, motel room, wherever it was, okay? And they're all there. And as I was being told by the Southern guys, Marines, etc., okay, people outside, wait a minute. The bullets that were pulled out of the body of Martin Luther King don't match the guns of any of these people, that, of any of these pictures that were in the newspapers. That they had on TV also, okay? In other words, it, it's a 30 30 caliber rifle shot bullet. Well, there were no 30 caliber rifles in the collection that we saw on television. So then, of course, just like uh, later on with, with the JFK thing, where, where people began to get suspicious over time, people knew the government was trying to snow them, period. So they, they backed off. In other words, they weren't going to get caught in mob actions. So they, they backed out. So we, we didn't have any confrontations of any note in Washington because the people knew the game, that this wasn't the guy who did it. Okay? They were mad at Uncle Sam for, for not bringing the right guy in, but we're not going to get into an involvement here with, and to, just to protect this guy here because down the road hopefully he would be protected. But the fact is that the, once we landed in Washington less than 24 hours after the assassination, the people already knew because they had seen the pictures. So we had no difficulties. And we're also the hometown boys because we're coming from Quantico just 30 miles south where a lot of these guys were in Washington, D.C. every night. They came back from Vietnam with a lot of money in their pocket, okay? And they got shot up there. And the Agent Orange was, let, was, was yet to come, of course. But they got shot up. They had money to get cars. And the young ladies in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area like these cars. So they, they, we knew a lot. So a lot of this, in fact, a lot of the ladies there would come up to us and provide coffee and donuts and things of this nature. Because their boyfriend was one of us, OK? <laughs> How have you looked at it, OK? So it was a very good situation socially, okay? We, we had no arrests, we had no problems. We, had, we never fired around at anybody in Washington. Now that may have happened a lot of places, but it didn't happen with us in Washington, D.C. And the Marine Corps had, had the Congress, had the White House, it had the Supreme Court building, mm -hmm. it had, it had the, the Library of Congress, they said, also. And the Army basically had the uh, things out further, they, they had the the, the Lincoln Memorial, they had the Pentagon, they had places foggy bottom with the Department of uh, a dip, the Diplomats Hangout and places of this nature. So the Marine Corps basically had the Hill area. It, we, we had no difficulties at all. So the, we had nothing that, that, that the journalists could have a good time with and write a good story <laughs> because it was just they walk, we walk, we talk, they talk back and forth. So yeah. it, it, was, it was congenial. Woo! So uh, tell us what happened after that. Okay, after that, they sent me to, they sent me to school that summer, mm -hmm. okay, comm school. Uh, after, after doing that uh, for, for my, a, a point, I, I took my two youngest brothers from Boston after a little uh, time in iron up there. I drove them back, put them on, a, and we, we went around Washington, D.C., and I drove back. I uh, drove them back to Boston, and th th they had gone to Fort McHenry, they had gone to, uh, to Valley Forge, they had gone to a lot of places where they had never been before. This is, these are my brothers, Daniel and, 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 and Gerald, okay? So w w we did all right in th th that summer. It wasn't, wasn't a heavy summer, I still, and I was getting paid, too, so it wasn't mm -hmm. hard to do. Of course, in June of 68 was the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, what do you remember about that? Uh, I don't remember too much about Robert Kennedy, but the, the, I, I, do, I can read you the after details that have, as, a, as a historian have gone over this thing here. Robert Kennedy took over from the brother. Uh, LBJ was in the White House. Uh, Robert Kennedy and LBJ didn't, uh, didn't mix too well, I put it mildly. Uh, Robert Kennedy was a Kennedy. 
he liked the crowd, he liked to rub shoulders, he liked to shake hands and do things of this nature. He had a lot of kids, okay? Uh, so he, he, people didn't bother Bobby Kennedy. Ethel was the same way to, from what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Well, he had just beaten, in California, he had just knocked off LBJ, his chances of getting to the White mm -hmm. House. Uh, th there was a, was a famous television uh, journalist, not journalist, uh, promoter of, of such, that was his manager, and he insisted on taking Bob Kennedy into the kitchen and out the back door somewhere because the crowds were too big out front. Well, Bobby Kennedy resisted this because the Kennedys always liked the crowd. They always liked the, 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 uh, an audience. This is the way they, they did things, okay? Uh, and they were entitled, and he, he, he was, really didn't want to go there because of, I want to meet the people. These are the people who just gave me the election victory in California. So he wanted to shake hands, rub shoulders, however you want to look at it. Uh, so he goes into the kitchen. Uh, there's a guy behind him uh, who he had never met before. There's a looking at a guy who, kind of fuzzy looking, okay? And this guy who was fuzzy looking ahead of him, uh, as the people, the media said, was, was, was kind of offish. His name's Sirhan Sirhan. And he had, a, he had a hard time standing up. Well, when the, when, when the things came down the line, uh, and the autopsy, if it was known to have been done the right way, would have shown that Bob Kennedy had two or three shots from a twenty-two pistol in the back of his neck. So hand to hand is 180 degrees out in front. So right from the get-go, the government has been hiding this situation for, for eons of years. Is this a conspiracy? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 however, the, the, the official books don't say that. But that's the way it is, because the people do. And the, the gun, for instance, that was used came out of the police locker. Because the lands and grooves, like we discussed earlier, of that, those 22 caliber shots matched the lands and grooves of a, of a pistol, 22 pistol, which was in the LA Police Department's official locker. Mm. So somehow or other, somebody opened up the locker, took the pistol, uh, put a couple of rounds into it, did a job on the back of his head, and then put it back somewhere, who knows where. So, I mean, it was, a, people picked that one up very quickly. And to this, to this day, uh, Sir Hans Sir Hans is still in jail. And members of the Kennedy family have been fighting to get him out. That, that's, so you, 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 we have to look at it in that light. Okay. Jim, let's go back to communication school. What were you being uh, trained at while you were in communication school? I, I was being trained in communication school to be, when you send a bunch of troops out to do anything, even if they just have been a vehicle, okay? You have to have a radio for them. Uh, you have to have a radio for them. <clears throat> Places you had to have telephones for. Uh, you had to have classified material which you could use to encode into telephones, into radios and the like. And this is where I was being trained. What types of antennas? You had to put it on certain aircraft. You had to put these things on certain other places. You had mobile jeeps where you had higher powered radios on, and etc. You had HF jeeps where you would shoot for the moon in a sense. Okay, uh, that would be what we in Vietnam we had HF jeeps that had uh, ham radio ability to talk to the West Coast. So we had a line of guys every night at these places talking to mother at the West Coast, or somebody else would patch them in to the East Coast. Okay. So to keep morale up, it was, there's no charge, of course, for this. So uh, everybody w w would do this. But I'm the guy who was, who was the guy, the officer in charge of all of this, lying and all that. Now, later on during the war, we had a, 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 a ship called the New Jersey. New Jersey would, would shoot bullets or, 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 or uh, ammunition rounds or bombs, whatever you want to call them, as big as a Volkswagen, a little beetle. And you'd see these things at night going across the sky and banging into some place, a bunker of 20 miles, 30 miles inland. It was my job to liaison with, from the Marine Corps on the land, somewhere with the naval people. Uh, I didn't direct them, but I had Navy people who did the direction. Um, it was my job to lay in the, not cable, because we're talking in the ship out there, so to, to make sure we could communicate with them. That was my position. So you went to communication school, summer of 68. Tell us what happened once you got out of there. Once, once I got out of there, I, I had some leave and I was signed. Then I was 
I get leave, and they, they, they assigned me back, uh, they gave me a flight ticket to go to Vietnam. I got an airplane in L.A., uh, out not near Fort Space, which is just outside the city, about 40 miles outside. Uh, I don't know if it's still an Air Force Base today. But we get on the plane, we landed in Hawaii. They let us get off the plane in Hawaii. Uh, we could go around the thing to get something to drink or eat, but for every door there were 15 MPs that wouldn't let us go out the door. Okay, So we're allowed to get some, something to drink, and, and we're allowed the use of the, of the men's room. There were no ladies in the men's room. And then we had to get back on the thing. So. They were taking precautions to make sure that we uh, didn't stay in the big islands or the little islands. So we get back on the plane. They sent us into uh, Okinawa. We spent a few days in Okinawa getting refitted for, for equipment and the like. And they sent me down on a plane with a bunch of other guys into Da Nang Air Base and uh, assigned to 11th Marines, which was the artillery organization for 1st Marine Division. I was the signal officer in the Army's jargon for that. I was assigned, my boss, I was the second lieutenant, my boss at 311, at 11th Marines, I'm sorry, 11th Marines was, was a major, who I met later on over the years. Nice guy. All right, when you were, uh, what was the equipment that they were um, assigning you when you were going to Vietnam? Uh, uniform? We had, we had uniforms, we, mm -hmm. we had camouflage uniforms, we had jungle boots, we had the helmets with the camouflage stuff. We, we had some from special clothing, whatever. We, had, we all had green t-shirts, not white t-shirts, and things of this nature here. Uh, the the change of so quite a change of socks and like jungle boots, like I said. We had our shots that were given to us in Okinawa, <laughs> the last shots before we went over there. Uh, and what, in my job, I was assigned to 11th Marines, which is the artillery for the 1st right. Division. Mm -hmm. I was assigned as, as the assistant uh, cob officer to a major. Later on, he became a colonel in the Marine Corps. Okay. Uh, and in, in that situation, I, he assigned me additional duties. For instance, he was in charge of the Oak Officers Club, which was a gee dunk about the size of here in the other room. Mm -hmm. uh, there were slot machines there, and my job on Sunday afternoons was to clean the slot machines up. Okay? <laughs> and I would, yeah. And I had to count the money out and all that. And, uh, and I would ask the boss, I says, uh, Major, what are we gonna do? We're gonna change numbers, that we, where you can adjust the wheels, where you can have more oranges and apples and, and bananas coming across. <laughs> we're gonna have more winners. He says, no, we're doing all right right now. Okay, so we're doing that. So, but it, you can adjust it to have more winners very quickly. He, all done by hand, no computers at this time, okay? But there were, say, four wheels with apples, etc. cetera, or you know, the drill. Uh, and then I went down to the Staff NCO Club, which was the E6s and above, and did the same. Now, everybody else was, was taking a snooze on a Sunday afternoon but me. I was a young, I was the only second lieutenant in, in, the, in the regimental headquarters. I was the, 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 the dirty job officer, however you look at it. Now, that translated to the next edition. Somebody had to do the security platoon at night. So, Sometimes I'd be at the bar there, making sure things were all done. We waited for this young, this young Vietnamese girl to show up, and she would take care of the bar and smile at the guys and get big tips and do all right. Okay, she did okay for herself, real nice lady. And uh, we, we, when, when she got there, I was loose at that point because I was making the drinks. I was the bartender. Okay, until she came in, uh, and I had to make sure that the colonel got got the right gen, right vermouth for Jed for his because he he, he got a. He had something special to drink, okay? So we had to make sure that was done right. But down, down the hill, the Sergeant Major had a similar situation, which I was told. I, but down there, I only, counted the, I only counted the things of the slot machines and worked the slots there, too. This was for the E6s, 7s, 8s, and 9s, okay? So I had to do both of these on a Sunday afternoon, count the money and the like. Then I would get tapped in the shoulder. Now, one night, I get promoted to first lieutenant, and I had to put some money on the bar, okay? As uh, this, is, this is the usual ceremony goes. But the major says, by the way, you can't drink tonight because you're going over the wall, okay? So that night I was like three out of four nights at that time. I was going through the, through the wire with 30, 40 guys and would set up patrol, platoons and look for security, make sure the NVA were coming to visit us that night. Mm -hmm. So we had to do this thing here. Uh, did we get shot at? The answer is yes. Did we get anybody get hurt? The answer was no. But uh, they sent me a few times up to a place called High Van Pass, which is way up in the mountains, to 
God, you ended up there for a couple of days. And I had probably 35, 40 guys with me. Not a full platoon, but we had a lot of stuff. But we, we also had the direct line into the, to, into the division artillery place if we had needed to be, to be protected very quickly, directly into calling them up for eight inch shots to be landed in front of us, not little, little things. Uh, and at the, at the same time there, uh, my friend next door, from by who I had known from, 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 from school for many years, at, at Marine Corps, family had been to Holy Cross and whatever, but in an event, he had the, his unit wasn't the artillery people, he had the division band, he had the comp company, he had the, the, the bakers there who uh, had to be sent back at a certain time to make things for the general's mess, the, 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 the things of this nature here. Uh, he had those guys, so we were the adjacent units. That I get, after I made second lieutenant, they moved me out, but they kept him there. And about three, four weeks after I left, he's still there, uh, the NVA were all over the place. And they had to bring in what was called Puff the Magic Dragon, which was a big C-130 aircraft, which was loaded with machine guns and everything else and other ordnance. And it went over that hill where the NVA were and just annihilated a lot of them. My friend that night picked up a Silver Star. Okay. So in other words, there was activity around where I was clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was out of there at the time. I was back in the, I was heading for the Leosha border. Uh, I, was, I was assigned to duty as the Signal officer, comm officer for 3rd Battalion, 11th Marines, in support of the 7th Marine Infantry Regiment. I uh, was also the headquarters CO. Both billets were by the book to be assigned as a captain. So I was doing two captain billets as a two months in grade as a first lieutenant. So mm -hmm. I was a busy bee. You were indeed. I, I was. I, I had a lot of troops and I didn't get along too well with the colonel was in charge. But, but that was neither here nor there. Uh, he, uh, he wanted painted rocks and things of this nature here. I wouldn't have time for this sort of stuff. But the, the other drill there is that I went up to a place called R.C. Banat. R.C. means mountain or whatever, overlooking all of the border there. It had been a French resort by helicopter. Went over the place, walked around. The, the Marine Corps had a big trans radio transmission site there to check and things over. The pool was no longer a pool that was, was filled in, basically, with dirt and all that. But it was a resort for the French when they had this place decades before. But in, in any event, uh, did, did, uh, I, I, did, I, I was, as I said, the commander. I, I met a guy who was a sniper, a scout sniper. Okay? He, he wrote a book later on, and he gave me a copy of it. Uh, he had 120 firm con confirmed kills himself. He had done two tours, he had 120, some say more than that, but in his book he just said 120. He was able to show those. He came to work for me one day when his boss, Colonel up above, did not like snipers. Okay, the guy who came in as the regimental commander, the 7th Marines, did not like the use of scout snipers because he didn't think that was a way of warfare. Okay, now everybody who got that position before him had, had, had pulled a lot of strings because invariably, if things went reasonably well, these colonels would make a brigadier general of themselves very shortly thereafter. So it was a highly sought afterwards. Why they ever let somebody who didn't like snipers, I don't know. But the regimental sergeant major was himself a former sniper. And he right away didn't cotton to this guy right away because he had been a sniper himself. So there was a, this uh, guy who was a, he was, a, he was an E6 at the time, his name was Hathcock. Uh, he came out of North Carolina. He met his wife at a bank in North mm -hmm. Carolina. And she didn't know what he did in the Marine Corps. She didn't know he was a scout sniper until she saw one of the local North Carolina newspapers, a story about what her husband had, was doing, what he did for a living. So she thought he was doing something other than being a sniper, okay? So uh, they still stay married, put it that way. Uh, but but in, in, any, in any event, uh, Hathcock, I put him up in the towers, which were made from telephone poles, four of them, and I had control of those where we could see for distances because we had starlight scopes, which you could use at night to look for things. And I put him up in the towers in my 
sex security region, region of, the, of, the, of the big peninsula, the hill there. Uh, so he was out of the range of the, the colonel at 7th Marines who didn't like snipers, who really only wanted him to burn the trash and do other things, okay? So he, this was his, his game. So in, in any event, I had to keep this from my boss because my boss was the artillery officer for this colonel, okay? So we didn't want him to know too much about what we were doing, okay? Mm -hmm. However, my major who I worked for, who was the, the guy who ran the guns for, seven, for 311, he knew he had to know, so we, we worked it out with him. So that when at three in the morning they would hear some 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 shots being shot from inside the, the, the security area to the outside, he, he knew who, where, why, and where. It was coming from one of the towers with a starlight scope, digging somebody who was just ready to put a mortar round into a mortar and throw it out to our, our and break up our, our sleep at night and kill us. Mm -hmm. So this is how you had to do the work. You had to get along with people. You had to get along with people and do these things. But the, current, the colonel was not good to me with the paperwork when I left. So uh, I, I had to have help down the road with that. And how long were you in this particular duty station? I was in this duty station. I was there probably for uh, in country for, for, for 13 months. I was, I was there probably for, for 10 because we moved a month before I left to another place about 30 miles south when they were starting to pull out a bit of out of Vietnam, mm -hmm. and we had the same problems there. The, it was an army facility for many years, and the army had gone by helicopter from point A to point B by helicopter. Well, we had guys on the ground. We had to walk the, the, the places, a lot of mines, so we had to pick up and things of this nature. So it was it was dangerous duty, not necessarily for me because I was on the ground all the time there, headquarters to somewhere arranging things, but it was was not a safe place to be. I managed to get out of country twice, okay? The first time I got out of country was they sent me, and they had, my brother had gone to the same type of school somewhere else. We had to learn to do offline encryption. In other words, you would get a message and you would put it into a thing, would mix the wheels around certain ways, set them in certain things, it would come out and decode the thing, offline encryption. They, they, they sent me to a place called Yakuska, Japan. I was up there for 10 days. It wasn't hard to take. It was cold. I was cold, but I was able to put ice skates on and go skate at Lake Yamanaka for a while, okay? No hockey, just skating for a while. So it was a, a change of pace for a while. And I was, in, I was able to go to Tokyo every night, so it wasn't hard to take. Because being a classified school, you couldn't take anything home with you. So it was, there's no homework you could do because you weren't allowed to take that stuff out of the school. You know, everything was locked up at night, and you didn't see it. So. Uh, it, it, was, it was good in that regard. So he took the, the bullet train and these other trains around Japan for about 10 days. Then, then I had to go back to work. Then I went, later on they sent me to, to Australia for R&R, &R, which was a good deal too, Sydney. I, was, I had paperwork and my money converted to go to a place uh, called Thailand, okay? However, the colonel tapped me on the shoulder, the XO major said, no, 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 we're going out to the woods for a couple of days, okay? You're not going to any airport, to any place to go to Thailand. You're gonna to have to throw your money back in again. So he squashed that. So it was, a, I almost made it to Thailand too. It was very close. Money was converted, everything else. Because in Vietnam, as you probably gathered, you're dealing with special script. They did not want the locals to get the Yankee greenback dollars is what they didn't want. Because that would mess their economy. That was their excuse. All right. So uh, you, sa you said earlier that you were in country for about 13 months, right. which means that you would have been in Vietnam until 1970? About that. About that. All right, so tell I was a little before that. A little before that, okay. Because I, I got out of, I came off of duty in September 1970. Mm-hmm. Now, before that, I was in the Mediterranean. Well, the other side. Right. So tell us about that. Uh, I wrote letters to, to the guy who was in charge of assigning people like me to this. He, he received three letters. Well, I had written five letters to make sure that he got the letters. I, I wrote X's, but he says, I got three here for you. I said, that's five. 
But I, I, I'm, I'm back in the United States. I'm a bachelor. Okay, I'm, there's nothing for activity around North Carolina for, 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 for a Yankee like me from Boston. Because once we open up our mouths, the, the, the ladies <laughs> move on, okay? Nice knowing you. So in, in, in any event, uh, if, the, if, you know, if you're on active duty, it will be a different story, okay? If you're gonna be around for 20, 30 years, there'll be a different game. But they know you're in and out of town. So when I was on the, I was on the Mediterranean there for, we went to the road to Spain on the ships, ship to shore. We had five ships. I was in charge of the communications for the Marine Corps for all five ships. Going back and forth from ship to ship with telecom and things of this nature. Computers hadn't quite come in at this time. Uh, but the group, the technical basic for the group uh, was in case American embassy was attacked, that we were there to reinforce the embassy. You could send the Marine Corps in because the embassy guard was basically Marines beforehand. So that, that stopped a lot of international problems there. Okay, if you sent the army in, that's a different game. Mm -hmm. So I was assigned that duty and they sent me to, to, to over there in the ships and we, we, we did okay. We, I met some nice people over there. Uh, I was a bachelor still at the time for the record, didn't even know who my wife was, okay. Uh, but the, the, the drill here is that uh, we, we did okay. We went to Piraeus, Greece, we did the Greece. Uh, we're in North Africa, we were in Road to Spain. As I said, we were in our trip up to Munich. Okay, we're there. We went to Genoa. Munich, well, we got to Munich by going to, pulled into Genoa, Italy. Got on the train, that went through the Brenner Pass up into Munich, that route, okay. Uh, spent the week in, 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 in and we had to run around. We did okay. Then we came back to the ship, we had to go to the next port. But we were always ready. If not, something happened to quickly get out to the, back to the ship. That is, while we are in Munich, we, we had helicopters located, not just on the road at the Air Force Base to give us a quick lift to, to the ships and back out of country. I mean, it wasn't as if we went to some ski slope and disappeared <laughs> for a couple of days. So we, th that was not the, the drill. Uh, but I did that, had a good time, came back, and so how was the ride over there? Well, I said, the ride, well, the ships are bumpy, but I said, I did something on the ride coming back. I, I, uh, I got to know the dentist, okay? Uh, he needed some things done for his, for his dental practice before he became a full dentist, and one of the things he needed was he needed to do some more wisdom teeth. So on my way coming back on the, on the ship, crossing the Atlantic from Spain to North Carolina, about say seven or eight days, I had four wisdom teeth pulled. Okay, so I I, I said that's I, I, I was going nowhere on the ship. I was just sitting there. You, could, you, could, you couldn't concentrate and read books. So you, I said I'll I'll do it. So we I, 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 we went through that process. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was there. All right, you're back in the United States minus four wisdom teeth. Were you still a first lieutenant? I was still a first lieutenant. All right. And what happened after you uh, hit the shore? After I hit the shore, back there, uh, uh, the, I, uh, I was there for a short time and then I, my time was up. It would have been August of 70. Mm -hmm. August of 70, I checked out. Um, August, May, August of 70, and I went back to Boston. September of 70, I'm at the Little Red Schoolhouse overlooking Logan Airport, East Boston High School assigned there as a history teacher. And I hadn't been in the city of Boston too many times over the interim, other than visit quickly the family. It was a different world. Must have been. From, from when I left for over a three or four year time period. Mm -hmm. Things had changed dramatically. So I, I, uh, I, I was a history teacher there. At this point I was a tenured teacher. So there wasn't much they could do unless I did something wrong because it, they, I, I hadn't been around, but meanwhile, they had to give me pass go, so I was on step forward of the salary lanes and moving up, per se, to make some money. Uh, I had a car, I had an MGB, brand new off the boat, bought it for overseas delivery as a bachelor. Uh, I couldn't drive at the school, however, because I, East Boston High, if I lived at the parking lot, somebody would, do it, would put a, a knife in my wheels, wire wheels, soft roof and the like. So uh, I, I had a Beetle, I had to drive back and forth to school of Volkswagen. 
At one morning, I was, I, I, one afternoon, I, I obviously yanked some kid off because I came back and, uh, and, and the three of the four wheels had a knife for them after school at Eastie High up on the hill. So it's a good thing it wasn't the, the MGB. It would have been totaled. Mm -hmm. They would have cut the roof and done who knows the seats and everything else. Wow. So I, I, I yanked some kids some t some point that day, whatever. So that's the way it is. How long were you t did you teach at East Boston? I taught in East Boston for about three or four years as a history teacher. So you were there when desegregation took place? I was there when segregation came to town. Wow. Tell us what that was like. At East, it was not a problem because what the, the, the local folks did, uh, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, uh, the, they, they, they would enter the tunnel, they'd leave a car in the middle of the rush hour in the tunnel, leave the car, turn the engine off, take the keys, jump the car just ahead of it and go right out the tunnel. Now, this is rush hour. How are you going to get that, that car without keys out of the tunnel? They did that a few days and people re realized we have to keep East Boston out of the busing plan for a while, okay? Because this, has got, this, could, go, this could happen any time. Now, it was the locals controlled that situation with the tunnel. Now, I don't think at that time we had the other tunnel either. I think we only mm -hmm. had one. We only had one tunnel. <laughs> so the other was being constructed. So, uh, so the busing would eventually get to East Boston. It got there several ways. The projects began, you could see more and more of, of uh, brown and black in the projects. Uh, there were projects in East Boston. The Heights mm -hmm. and the projects at Maverick Square and the like had been for years. Uh, and so it was just a matter of time before things were going to get them in other ways. Now, one of the ways is, is that at the high school, they pulled out the, 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 the co-op course, for, which was machinist, okay? They pulled that off and moved it to the ORC in, in Roxbury, okay, with the teachers and everybody else. So th they, they, they cleaned it out that way at the, at the, the schools. Uh, the printing came out of Hyde Park High, for instance. That was moved out of Hyde Park into... into uh, into the ORC in Boston too. So this is how they avoided a lot of these things there. So if you wanted these jobs, you had to go to these other schools in the city, in the inner city per se. So th this is how they did that. Now, I was there probably for four or five years and in the meantime, I, I looked around the schools and I said, that, that, there's no way I'm gonna be the head of the history department here because I know he's in line to be the head of the history department, a guy named Poto. Later on, he became the headmaster of the school. So I says, there's no way up the line to be department here. So, and I, so at that point, I finished my history program at BC and didn't want to go for a doctorate because I said, like, what am I going to do with it? I don't want to sit and write books. But, but, but the fact still is, I, I, I worked in special ed after that. I worked as a, as a with the school at Boston State. I, had a, I already had a master's in counseling over at Boston State. So I, I got a job. I mean, I, I took... Uh, degree in school psychology. So working with kids in high schools, middle schools, elementary school, then my GI Bill was still there. So I finished up a doctorate degree at uh, Boston University, uh, <laughs> in the College of uh, Liberal Arts over there. All, all my courses were in the College of Liberal Arts because I already had the basic degree. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to go to flight school, but the wife said no. I, I had money for, for East Coast Aerotech. Uh, the wife said, no, you're not going to. So that's the, way, that's the way it goes. You had mentioned this before the interview uh, that you used the GI Bill to go to, school, go to college. Oh, yeah. And did you um, use your other, any other veterans' vet benefits? Uh, when, when I, the, my, my first year at, at East Boston High, I, I met this lady who came down and told me I had to straighten my act up because the kids were going from my class to her class and they were telling about what they had done in my class. And she, so she, she said, this has to be embarrassing, okay? But she straightened me out, okay? And this is, this is my first year at East High. Uh, now, let's just say it's October, she's telling me these things, September. So in November, there was a ship that was sunk called the Peter Stuyvesant. Yeah. I was a, a party boat on the docks near Pier 4, okay? And there was a big Marine Corps ball there, okay? And I invited her to this ball and she came along, okay? And it wasn't, this is around November, early November. Uh, long story short, uh, come the, come the uh, 
1st of January, she and I are engaged. Okay, so things move fast in certain areas, okay. Uh, she was an Irish-American girl out of Brighton who had gone to Emmanuel College, okay. She had been Presentation Academy or the, the school before that. So she was a, a local lady, okay, Didn't, not from North Carolina or anywhere else. So when you, you travel around the world, you come back, you get what's the lady next door. I mean, that's the way it is. Okay, so who goes? So in, in, in any event, uh, we, we worked these things from, from then on. And come, uh, it would, would come uh, first of uh, the year, January, she gets a wedding ring. She gets an engagement ring. So we're, we're ahead in August of the following, following August, uh, less, than one, less than a year after knowing each other, we're going up the aisle in Presentation Church in, in Brighton. So the world, world moves fast sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I understand you're also a member of the Disabled American Veterans. Yes. Were you wounded or was there something else that happened aside from the hip? I don't have a Purple Heart. Right. And let's, let's leave it, start with that point. I don't have a Purple Heart. I had a map in my hand, a plasticized map, which you use for a Justin Phillip Heart. Be like, a, a geographical map of, of the White Mountains type for 10,000 meters in blocks. You'd use this for artillery shells, okay? And what happened, I'm, my, that we didn't have the plastic, clear plastic over there to do these things right. So my favorite sister, my only sister, sent me some stuff over to take care of things. She and the mother sent it. So a lot of us had some clear plastic, uh, which you put on counters and like, usually it's colored, but this was clear. And I'm holding one of these things there, and next thing you know, something, a rocket comes in, and there's a hole in it about your big, and it wasn't a hole cut by a pair of scissors, as you can see, it was the heat factor, okay? And it, it, it missed me by your much, okay? Now, I'm into Duchess to High, bringing this into show eventually to the, to, to, to the students at, at, the, uh, at, the, at the Rogers Middle School in High Park later in the day. Because this, over there, there's a, there was a Vietnamese language cluster for Vietnamese students. And this is a map which everything was listed in Vietnamese, which they were going to use to help these kids bridge from the Vietnamese to. So I was going to let this guy borrow this map. It's a big map, mm -hmm. but there's a whole about this big in it. Okay. And I'm standing there, and a, a, a compatriot of mine, Eddie Donnelly, who came out of High Fails Con originally, he was a a, a young enlisted guy in a place called Korea earlier on in, in his, his life. Uh, he had also had attended the same high school I did years before me, Boston Tech. He looked at this in front of a lot of uh, people and he says, Jimmy, this comes any closer. And this, this guy's a war veteran. He says, this, this, this could have cut blank, blank, blank off of you, okay? And the people began to roar and laugh, but he was very serious and he was right, okay? So the, the dice can be very hot. Okay. I had been in helicopters that had been punched out of the sky. They, they, they shot and they, got, they landed on the ground. One of them was heading out of, in Viet, leaving Vietnam to go to the, get the airplane out. Mm -hmm. okay. they, they, that happened to the a helicopter. We were leaving a fire base about 40 miles south of Da Nang with, and they came down. Now, this, they sent us a bigger helicopter. We went from a 46 to a 53. And before we left with the 53, we all had to go against the side because what they were doing down the center is they were putting body bags on stretchers. Now, the rest were all leaving Vietnam. You could have obviously heard a pen drop. There are they and there are us along the side of the bigger helicopter. We made it and there wasn't a word said or tried to be communicated. Everything was there as the body bags are 12, whatever the number was, two rows up the middle. Uh, but the first one, they lost air pressure and they, they melted them away. But meanwhile, all of our weapons had been turned in. You're talking about gun control. So we had no guns. So if we had landed a mile around and Charlie was waiting for us, we had nothing to shoot at them. The guys in the, in the helicopter may have, but you're talking 15 or 20 guys with the stuff. They had, there's not a gun to be had among us. So you, you, you wonder how things can, the, the dice can be hot, it can be cold. But so we run with this, and where is the, my daughters have seen this map with the, the, the big burn on it. You can see it wasn't done with the scissors, but, but uh, the guy who I loaned it to, I, I never got it back. He moved his room from one year from one part of the building to another, and somebody threw the map out because it's our home. 
Oh. That's the way it runs. Oh, dear. Well, aside from uh, DAV, did you join any other veterans organizations? Yes, I am. I am past commander of the uh, Westwood uh, Post 320 American Legion. I am active at it today also. I was past commander. Uh, I, at a monthly basis, you'll see me one night at a Legion meeting, and the later on, I, I represent that post at the county meeting uh, in, in Dedham, post 18. That's the Legion's fact. I don't go to uh, conferences, big conferences at all, okay? Uh, I get other things I have to take care of, okay? Uh, in regard to the, to the, to the DAV, uh, I, I, they want me to run the chairs where you started fourth command to fifth command and will go up. I've already done this, I told them at the American Legion, and I don't have the time for it. So I am the officer of the day who takes the attendance, checks things out, introduces the unit to the new people who come in. Uh, the unit, this unit has th several thousand people technically on the books. Uh, on, a, on a drill, we may have 40 people, 50 people. These are all guys, and uh, maybe one or two ladies. They're all over, over 40 years of age. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm active in, in those types of endeavors. Uh, but uh, as I said, I, I, I'm, I'm the, I told them very clearly, I've done the chairs, I've done that. Uh, I, at a certain point, I have to be home at night. I have a, a young lady who I met at East Boston High School, who, who by eight, about quarter or nine, has to get in bed at night, and I gotta put her, make sure she gets into bed, and take care of the dogs and whatever. Uh, so I'm, I'm not walking at 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I made it very clear to the people, without getting into details, mm -hmm. I get things I have to be at, at right. night. And Jim, uh, what medals or accommodations did you earn while you were in the Marine Corps? While I was in the Marine Corps, I have a combat action ribbon from Vietnam, that I was in, in a combat area. I have no silver stars, I have no bronze stars, I have no medals of honor, no Navy crosses, that's it. Mm -hmm. Now, the guy who was next to me, who came from Holy Cross, he picked up a Silver Star two weeks after I left in the next unit. So the, the potential clearly was there for me to have gotten something, but I was nowhere to be seen. I was moved out. Jim, before the interview, I believe it was one of your, either your children or grandchildren who served in Iraq? My, my, my older daughter is an Iraqi veteran. Mm -hmm. And what branch? She was, a, she was in the Rhode Island National Guard. She joined to fly helicopters. Uh, she, didn't quite do that, and a lot of reasons for that. But her, she was a communication officer for, this, for the unit. Uh, and she, her unit commander fought like heck to get these people activated for the National Guard unit, activated for, for Iraq. And he got them, and they went over there, and she got seriously hurt uh, during a rocket attack. And he, he gave her a bronze star, I mean, a, a purple heart. In a hospital situation, she says, I'm gonna give you the purple heart. And the next day he come back and says, no, you're not going to get it. I'm going to take it away from you. And it's been litigation in a sense since. Mm -hmm. This guy has stepped on people all the way up, particularly females. And I'm not presenting that to three ladies as a sexist question. The Providence Journal newspaper had, had some big stories on this guy within the last two years. About he, there is, there is, there are women who are being taken advantage of his in his units. Mm -hmm. He's a general, and he's totally ignored. And even though his wife is very active, and she's on the payroll as a GS worker there, mm -hmm. uh, and they they're not happy. But in, in, the, in the case here, th th this is uh, this is a guy who, as I told you earlier in Vietnam, we, we, we had the bar, the staff NCOs in the offices, troops had the beer. They could get the other if they had wanted to. We're not talking. We're not even talking a marijuana situation. Okay. Uh, so they have it, but, but, but in over Iraq, it's, it's a no-no because of the, the, the religious mm -hmm. factors. Mm -hmm. uh, but every month he'd get a bottle that would be shipped in for him and a bottle for the sergeant major of hard liquor. He's around today. Mm -hmm. And my daughter has a case sitting in Washington, D.C. for her Purple Heart, mm -hmm. written up by uh, the, our veterans agent who uh, at one time was a, a lady who was a colonel, uh, admin type. In, in the Air Force for 20-something years. Her husband was a flyer, okay? He, 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 her concern is in her getting back to duty. If this balloon goes up again, he may get activated for duty as a flyer. So th this is not a good game for her. So you, you, you see how they, they activate me? No, I'm 100%. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I, I have Agent Orange. There's no argument with that. But the guy you met last week, the week last week was my twin brother. He's my veterans agent. Now, how, how stressful can families be? My mother was not easy to get along with when her twins were in Vietnam at the same time. Not easy at all. Okay. Uh, and th there were some flashes here and there, but, but uh, it was, was not a good game. So, uh, I, and I can see it when my, my daughter gets hurt in Iraq. Okay. It's not directly what she can do. I have a friend who has three stars as a retired Marine general. He says, I can't get into that Army network, to, into the, to the board. The room is there with the thing. And he says, because of the budget of things going through Washington today, he says, I can't get in there myself for my, my daughters if I had to. In other words, he said, it's a con ball game going down there in Washington, D.C. today. So Jim, before we wrap up this uh, interview, how important was it for you to serve in the military? The, the military in my family, I won't say is a, is a professional way of life for, for, where we have full-time people. My father was in the National Guard sometime during the 20s or 30s, whatever. He, was, he went to, to Curtis Hall, which is the municipal building in Jamaica Plain, a big building there in Jamaica Plain there. Uh, Stone Miller, and a guy named Paul Dudley White, a very prominent doctor to be, checked him over and says, you can't serve. Now, he was a bachelor at the time, okay? You can't serve because you have cardiology problems. You have problems with your valves. He later on stayed with White for, for many, many decades, uh, and he got first-class treatment at MGH when he had to. He passed away uh, on the OR, in the OR years later and because he wasn't strong enough to handle the valve situation. Uh, Paul Dudley White wrote a nice letter to the Boston Pilot newspaper on my father. So it, it's out there. So it, it's a situation. Dudley White was the person uh, who, who was one of the guys with what you eat and everything else, exercise and whatever. His daughter was his secretary, his nurse, his, his jack of all trades, okay? She would roll into his house, which is with that the, the, the footbridge from the Esplanade lands in, on, on, on Beacon Street there. Uh, the office was there in the early 50s. Uh, and she came to work every morning on a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Okay. She roared it up, she gooed him. This is just across the street from Emerson College. And of course, the students are going rah, rah, rah in the morning there. <laughs> and this is the lady, she walked up the stairs, she was his nurse, she was everything. So uh, uh, he was quite an individual, Paul Dudley White, that you don't normally hear those stories. His, his daughter was that way. And his, his doctors will say that there is not a hospital in Boston that doesn't have his picture on the wall. Uh, that, uh, so my father had the best treatment that was available at the time. But he always made sure to tell him his kids, if you got a medical issue, seven kids, you go downtown. You don't stay at the local county hospital. You go into the city to get it. MGH, uh, bring him a woman's uh, New England Baptist, whatever you want to do. St. Elizabeth, let you go downtown in a sense. So th 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 this is there. And as I said, th the tradition is there. He couldn't make it. Uh, I have members who were, I had a guy who, cousin Bob Curtis, my, my, uh, my aunt's his, 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 his nephew there, who was shot up bad in, in, in the Pacific of World War II. Uh, he, he has a, 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 either a bronze star or a silver star. He was a, he was a corporal. And very quiet. Another uh, member of the family served, and, and the guard was, what, like I said we earlier, with Mike Dukakis. Another was in the boats, uh, ran the boats, and if the war had gone, he would have been running along the shores. Another D Day situation type of a case. So the, the military thing runs in the house. The, the career military does not. I mean, there was another cousin who was an Army artillery officer, uh, did his time as a lieutenant captain, get out. So, uh, but, but there were no generals, no colonels, no sergeants, major in, in there. That's mm -hmm. the, the, in and you're out. Mm -hmm. So you can look at it in several lights. Mm -hmm. So Jim Martin, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you for having me.